Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be located. Thanks for joining us again this week after uh, last week's What's New webinar in Global Mapper Standard. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at What's New in Global Mapper Pro uh, version 25.1. Uh, I am joined by my colleague and friend, Mackenzie. Uh, how are you doing, Mackenzie? Uh, I'm doing well, Jeff. Thanks for having me on this webinar. I'm excited to talk about some Global Mapper Pro new things. Great. Yeah, it's always, always fun to have you and, and get into some of these discussions. Um, so today we'll focus on a few new larger topics that are uh, covering new functionality in Global Mapper Pro and look at some specific workflows and discuss some things as well. Before we get into that, just a reminder uh, to anybody new, uh, the webinar is listen only. Uh, you should see a questions panel on your um, go-to interface, so please, please utilize that. Um, we do our best to answer those live. Um, we don't always get to all of them, but between Mackenzie and I, we do our best to answer those. And then if anybody has to step away or you love this so much, you'd like to watch it again, it is recorded uh, or will be recorded, I should say, and that'll be available usually in a week or so. And if you've signed up, you should get an email from our team when um, that posting is live for you to go ahead and watch the recording on our YouTube channel along with all the other great content on our YouTube channel as well. So if you ever have any questions or curiosities about the apps, I encourage you to um, go and take a look at our YouTube channel. We have uh, our next set of webinars planned out for the next few months. Uh, in March, uh, you'll be stuck with Mackenzie and I again. We'll be talking about some of our favorite tips and tricks in Global Mapper Pro. Uh, so not necessarily big, flashy new features, but maybe um, little workflow pieces or components of that nature that we really like or find useful, whatever the case may be. Um, so that's always a, a fun one for us to do because it lets us be a little more freeform. Uh, April of Blue Marble is our academic month, so someone will be on discussing our academic program. Uh, and then, I don't know, after that, we have a few more webinars planned, so, so keep an eye out there or on our Geotox Express website for some um, exciting upcoming announcements for new products and, and things like that. Mackenzie, do you want to give us a little overview of what we have upcoming on our training schedule, or a shorter version of it, anyway? Absolutely. So we've got a bunch of training sessions coming up for, you know, the rest of the year here at Blue Marble. Um, our next training session is going to be Global Mapper Training. Uh, it is online, um, so hosted through a platform like this um, where you're going to have workflows to follow along with the instructor, instructor and uh, learn a lot about how to use Global Mapper. Um, this training is broken into three different courses. So we have geospatial analysis in Global Mapper, more of the basics of using Global Mapper, um, some of that vector analysis, raster analysis, um, and that is March 18th through 20th. Um, following that course is terrain analysis in Global Mapper, so starting to work with that terrain data, 3D data, and all the analysis and many, many tools in the program that go along with that data type, um, and that'll be March 21st through 22nd. And then lastly, getting into some point cloud work, we have a LiDAR processing course um, using more and more tools in Global Mapper Pro, and that would be March 26th through 28th. Um, these are all listed on our website right now, so go ahead and you can check out um, those courses, what time they are, the uh, curriculum for each course, and sign up for whatever sections are relevant to your work if you're looking to learn some more about working in Global Mapper. Um, we also have an in-person training coming up. So if you're joining us from uh, Australia today around the area of Sydney or watching a recorded version of this webinar um, from that location, we do have an in-person global mapper training um, towards the end of April uh, and that will be in Sydney. So that information is also on our website if you're interested in attending some in-person global mapper training, meeting one of our wonderful um, tech support people who will be administering that training uh, in person live in Sydney. Um, again, visit our website for any, more information on any of those public training classes. Um, if you're new to Global Mapper or just want a refresher on some of the very basic functionality, we do have a free introductory self-training 
Introduction to Global Mapper course um, on our training website, training.bluemarblegeo.com. So if you're looking to review those basics or learn Global Mapper for the first time, I do encourage you to check out that training site as well. Awesome, thanks Mackenzie. Um, probably also worth noting, uh, Mackenzie and I are working on getting all of the what's new workflows up for uh, a limited time on the self-training website. So you can go ahead and work through this with this data. Um, probably in the next week or two, it'll, it'll be up on the uh, self-training website. So if you're itching to try something out with the data that we share today, that'll uh, be something to look out for. Okay, so um, today we're going to look at three different sections of Global Mapper Pro. Uh, we'll take a look at some updates to pixels to points. Um, so that's our, you know, photogrammetric tool. If you any, if you do any drone data processing, that's where you'll want to, um, you know, take a look at what is updated there. It's for improvement to some of those workflows and some pretty cool new functionality actually. Um, McKenzie's going to talk to us about terrain painting and the path profile. So if you were here last week, McKenzie showed us a whole bunch of new uh, updates to the path profile. And this is uh, kind of goes along with that. This is a, a pro level tool now added to the path profile. Um, so that tool's really come a long way. And this is a, some really neat functionality in that regard. Uh, then we'll take a look at some point cloud or LIDAR analysis related updates you know, some basics where we are expanding the point cloud QC tools we have and how we kind of compare and think about quality control of the point clouds. Um, and then a new option in our beta custom classification called subclassification, uh, which allows us to kind of refine existing or pre-classified points. So that's a, an interesting and exciting tool that we'll take a look at um, as well. So let me go ahead and bring up Global Mapper here. We'll take a look at our first workflow. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to send those our way. So in our, our first workspace here, we are looking at a um, very small subset of a photogrammetric workflow, right? I've got five or six images loaded and just a couple ground control points. So nothing major, we're not gonna go through a full workflow today, um, but I wanna highlight some of the new uh, functionality where we can auto place ground control points as we're setting up the pixels to points process. Um, <clears throat> as always, right, the images we're working with are geotagged, um, so they're just loaded as a little picture point. We can pop open a, image viewer and see those images, right? I zoom in, here's my target. We're gonna be looking at placing GCPs on that target. Uh, and when you take a look at the, the image, you also get a estimated coverage polygon. So you can see, okay, that target should be in this image. Um, not a guarantee, but usually a, a pretty darn close guess that where those will overlap. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the pixels to points tool. We'll actually come back and take a look at the wizard in a second, but for right now, I'm gonna go into the tool and use the main window. Just gonna load the picture points that I have here. So we'll see each of those images and I can you know, scroll through, take a look at them as I need to. The, the new piece here, the ground control points has kind of moved into its own, I will call it you know, ground control point manager window, um, et cetera, so that we can do some of the more advanced functionality that we may want. So when I pop this open, uh, first thing I need to do is load my control points in. And when that happens, each control point has a list of suggested images, which um, may overlap with that control point. And that's something we've always done. And previously users had to manually place the control point in each image and go through. Uh, well, what we've done is added an automated process of placing those control points. So what I'm going to do, uh, is be able to essentially say, this is what my target looks like, find all the other targets and place the point on the target. Uh, so for this first ground control point four, I'm just gonna happen to start with the first image in the list. I'm gonna scroll in and say, there's my control point. And I only have to do this once, I'm gonna define the target in the image. I'm gonna say, okay, my target looks like this and click and drag to recognize it. I'm asked if I want to then automatically find the rest. I do, um, this should find 
the target and all the remaining images. And it will tell you now, so that first one obviously is confirmed because I placed the um, definition of the target. And then we see these green highlighted ones or other images where it thinks it found the target. So I can go and take a look at each one. If I ever need to adjust it, I can select it, drag it, move it around. Once you do that and you place it, you'll see it then becomes confirmed. You can go through, repeat that process for each. That one's in a good spot. And that one looks pretty good too. So now I'm done placing that control point in all the images in which it needs to be in. I can do the same for a subsequent uh, GCP. Um, in this case, we're looking at the target closer to the water. So I'm going to zoom in here. Um, oops, sorry, close the window. Zoom in here and take a look at the target. So again, making sure I've got target number five here. Um, so they're, they're corresponding properly. Since we're at a new target, new set of images, I just define the target again, click in the center, drag out, and then find the rest. And so I intentionally grab this target because we don't see it in all of our images. And I want to talk about uh, why that is and how we address that. So first image looks good. That's the one I trained on. Second one, yeah, that could be moved a little. Maybe I'll, I'll drag that and move that a little. That's now confirmed. And then the third image has possible overlap, but it couldn't find the target. Very logical reason being, right? We don't have uh, the entire target in the image, so it didn't find a match there, but it says, you know, geographically, I expect the GCP to be there. Very simple, I can just click and manually add it in any instance of that nature. Once that happens, then, um, oops, that is now confirmed and those GCPs are set and ready to go. Uh, if we were pretending this was a full pixels to points process, you're all set placing your points, they're confirmed, you would close the window and then continue any other settings or processing as needed. Um, you know, when we first started looking at this functionality, uh, it seemed like something, oh, that'll, you know, that'll be cool, it'll be, you know, save users time, be a, a great way to speed up some of the pixels to points process. Um, and then in testing it, I actually did a full workflow, you know, dozen control points, maybe 200 images, and the way that it speeds up the process is great, right? You're not manually going through each image, placing the point, zooming, panning around, right? Everything um, gets associated much more quickly and, and really um, speeds up that process. <clears throat> but that's the so end of... Jeff, sorry, just while yeah. we're talking about pixels to points here, we did just have a question come in asking about if there is an image size limitation um, for pixels to points processing, um, data size, but also that individual image size. Ah, good question. Um, the the largest limiting factor, right? We have not said don't go any bigger than file size X um, or image count, you know, whatever. Um, so much of that is hardware dependent, right? The, any photogrammetric type processing is really hardware intensive. Um, I think memory, CPU, um, some portions of the process, GPU, right? So um, it's harder to give a fixed don't go beyond this value. Um, one thing the tool does try to do is it will auto detect if it thinks your image size and image count is going to be too large for your suggested for your current hardware and it will tell you hey we think you might run out of memory or whatever the case may be do you want to reduce your image resolution um, one of the reasons we see that image reduction and that's actually a manual option right here as well um, one of the reasons we see that is because effectively at some point you've gotten such high res imagery that you're not in fact getting any extra detail um, out of your process, so reducing it saves you time without the cost of too much accuracy. Um, so it's a very long way of saying, no, we don't have a fixed um, limitation of that nature. Thanks, Jeff. That's a common question we get, um, and it's always good to address when we're talking about this tool. Yep, certainly. Um, okay, let's take a look at another new little feature in Pixel to Points. Um, Oh, you know, I could have kept that data open. That's okay. So we're going to go into the wizard here. And the wizard guides us through basically setting up a easy, repetitive 
pixels to points type process, right? Maybe I don't need to manually place all my GCPs. Maybe I'm running it as a quick quality test and I only need a quick output. It's kind of some of the reasons you might use the wizard. Oh, I should have kept mine here. We'll just load some sample images. Doesn't matter what we're working with. Um, so once we have our data loaded into the wizard, there's two subsequent steps. Choosing your main output. So we have a variety of main outputs and you'll already see I have a custom one here. Um, that's what we're gonna talk about now. Let's say I choose an ortho image and then I go on to any additional things I might want to create. That could be DSM, contours, a variety of point clouds, uh, other information like that. What I have the ability to do is save those options as a template so that if I do this often, all I have to do on my um, project type page is select whatever I saved as custom, and then you'll see whatever options you saved there are retained, and go ahead and hit run so that you're not constantly um, going in, adjusting parameters, things of that nature. So it helps speed up getting that process um, going a, a little bit more quickly. So just something I wanted to uh, point out there. And then those are saved as part of the application. They'll exist after you close, reopen Global Mapper, et cetera. We don't have any other related questions. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to you, Mackenzie, so you can talk to us a little bit about the uh, path profile terrain painting updates. That sounds good. So I will go ahead and share my screen, and we should see Global Mapper come up here um, and I've got some terrain data loaded in. Now, as Jeff mentioned, um, in last week's webinar on the Global Mapper standard tools, um, we talked a lot about some different upgrades to the path profile tool um, related to Global Mapper standard. Now, this uh, terrain painting in the profile view is a tool in Global Mapper Pro. Um, a few versions ago, we introduced the terrain painting tool in the, the 2D view here. Um, up in the analysis toolbar, and this allows you to manually use your your cursor as a brush and edit the terrain mm -hmm. um, with a variety of operations here. So this is a tool that has been existing in Global Mapper. We've just simply expanded the capability of this tool to work in that cross-sectional path profile view, and that's what we're going to explore some today. So I'll grab my path profile tool from the analysis toolbar, and I'm going to just draw a simple profile across some terrain. Um, I'll go ahead and dock that window at the bottom so we keep it uh, in view here. I can zoom in on my profile a bit in my 2D view, and you'll see that the terrain paint tool has a toolbar button in the path profile window now. Um, enabling the terrain paint to work in the profile. Clicking on that toolbar button, I get that same terrain paint options dialog that pops up. Um, it is good to note here that, you know, enabling the terrain paint tool through the profile window allows you to terrain paint in this view, whereas enabling it from our, you know, main analysis toolbar allows that terrain painting in the 2D view. Um, those aren't like you're choosing which view you would like to do that editing in. Since some different options um, are available in the 2D view, and we've got a limited list of brush types in our cross-section path profile view. So I've enabled the path profile tool with in, within the path profile, I'm sorry, I'm tripping over my words. I've enabled the terrain painting tool within the path profile tool, and I'm choosing to edit on my present terrain layer and we can take a look at all the different operations we have. Now, these are the same that are available in the you know, existing terrain paint options. Um, I'll choose to raise my terrain height. You'll notice that some of the brush types are grayed out since I'm working in this cross-section view. We only have point and line types, which makes sense since I'm operating along this drawn path profile line. I can, of course, adjust my brush size, the um, height or how I'm altering the terrain and the feathering. Um, that brush size and feathering, if you guys can see uh, in the path profile view, I have a black dot for the center of where my cursor is, 
we have a red line coming off of that. That represents the brush size in the profile view. And off of that, we have the feathering distance um, with small blue lines. This mimics the red and blue brush size circles that you see in the overall 2D view. Um, and you can see those along my profile line as I'm moving my cursor in my profile view here. So to terrain paint, it's the same process. Um, you know, using a click and drag line option, I can click and drag along my profile, raise that terrain height. Coming back over to our dialog, we have those same undo and redo buttons. Um, and we can use different line types if I want to place vertices of this line along my profile. You know, I'm limited to the exact profile path that has been drawn here. And we're raising our terrain height within that. You can see that happen in the 2D view. That immediate um, edit is made. And if I close this terrain paint options, that's going to remain in the workspace. Um, if I want to save any edits to a terrain grid to an external file, of course, I would have to export the terrain. Some other options uh, available in the terrain painting tool are lowering the terrain height. You can create holes in your data by setting areas to no data. Um, you can fill gaps if you have areas of no data that you would like to cover up in your terrain. Um, and then you can slope the terrain along a line or across a line. So sloping the terrain along a line, I will set my slope to 30 degrees. And again, using my line option, the only one available for this operation, I can create a sloped area. We see it flattens my brush size and then creates a slope along that line. I can similarly slope the terrain across the line. So sloping to one side, the left or the right of the line that I'm going to draw in my path profile view. And we can see I've created an upslope of 30 degrees to one side of that line and then feathered it back down to the existing terrain on the other. So there's a lot of ways that terrain can be edited with this tool and opening up this tool in the path profile view just makes gives you another option for interacting with terrain and how you're viewing those edits. Um, Again, any edits that you make in the path profile view are going to be reflected in the 2D view and the 3D view as well. So you'll be able to see the impact of those edits on the surrounding terrain um, when they may not be all that obvious in the cross-section profile view here. Thanks, Mackenzie. That was awesome. That tool came out really well. I love how, how, that, um, how that performs. All right, let's go ahead and move over to uh, some of the new uh, point cloud related updates. So we have an, a new um, QC type tool uh, as part of um, our LiDAR workflow. And we had a lot of requests from users uh, asking for the ability to compare their point clouds to uh, a terrain layer. Right, we have already had the ability to, to compare point clouds to each other. Uh, we have a dedicated QC tool to compare it to control points. But oftentimes, you know, we're using some sort of already published uh, terrain data set as maybe our control, and we want to understand how our point cloud may um, deviate for that, maybe. Uh, different in, in, in what regard it may be different. So what we have uh, loaded right now, so I have a point cloud. This is a, you know, more or less unfiltered raw point cloud um, from near or of Devil's Monument National or Devil's Tower National Monument, excuse me, uh, out west in Wyoming in the United States. Um, so we can see, you know, standard point cloud, nothing too out of the ordinary visually. Um, and what we're going to do is compare it to a terrain surface from the same region. Uh, this happens to be a USGS product. So we're going to go ahead and say, okay, how does my point cloud relate to this already published existing surface? <clears throat> and we'll see, you know, an interesting little deviation here that was intentional. Uh, is a good way to highlight 
how this functionality works. So I can choose how far I want to be, um, what I want to allow as my minimum distance between the two features. Otherwise, um, you know, anything beyond that is going to be considered a change or something different uh, kind of beyond that tolerance. So I'm keeping that pretty tight here, uh, 15 centimeters. Um, the goal in this case, I want to look for features that deviate really from the ground surface. Uh, we have the you know options to maybe delete changed points. Uh, in this case, I don't want to do that um, or create a report and that saves a little report out. You can see visually, we don't need to, to make one of those right now. But what I wanna do is go ahead and look at the difference because what happens is those changed points get selected and put in their new layer. Um, <clears throat> if we look at them visually, right? And this is just from a top down first, right? It looks to me, right? I see a lot of you know, trees, brushes, shrubs. Maybe I'll pop open 3D view as well. And I would agree, right? It, there's pretty good holes in the data, right? I'm not seeing a lot of ground represented, but I am seeing change in, in all of um, the tree surface, right? And that, that stands to reason. Um, again, because so that source USGS terrain product uh, is right, doesn't have any vegetation, any surface features on it. It's strictly ground level. Um, but the point cloud, since it hadn't been filtered yet, still had all of those trees and things in it. And so this way I can see, um, you know, where those are. I can get a feel for how many of those features exist. Um, and you'll see that reported in a report as well. And it would tell you, you know, information like, um, deviation on how far points are off uh, as well. So another really handy way to uh, conduct a you know QC process of your point cloud if you're using um, a terrain layer as reference. Let me go ahead here and then we'll take a look at one more new feature. Let me pull up the right uh, workspace here. Okay. Uh, so we're looking at now a Point cloud uh, happens to be a LiDAR scan kind of near our office headquarters. Um, <clears throat> you'll see this is, you know, a pretty mixed landscape. We'll take a look in, in 3D as well, right? So we have so sl sloping terrain kind of down to the water. We have trees, buildings, um, ground, obviously, uh, you know, so very diverse, some larger buildings, some smaller buildings, features of that nature. Um, we, with the release of version 25, have a, a new beta tool out for custom classification, which we've discussed, um, that effectively allows a user to, um, utilizing some of the machine learning classification methods that we have, uh, custom train and classify unique features. Um, I believe we have showed in some of our sample data shows uh, airplanes, maybe we've looked at components of a bridge, um, things like that, kind of finding very specific and niche objects that otherwise, uh, you know, standard built-in classifiers don't exist for. What this new feature subclassification allows us to do um, is it allows us to pull out features that might exist as part of another classification. Um, so in this regard, what we're going to look at is I have my ground classified and that also almost always is going to include uh, road features as well. But I may want to further define and separate ground, or excuse me, roads from ground. So I can do that with the subclassification of the ground product. The first step to that is running uh, a dedicated segmentation process. Uh, what that allows us to do is identify points in our point cloud based on their smaller components or segments. Uh, we have some automated methods of this nature, right? So you could do this type of machine learning on your ground classification, which I did, um, your buildings, et cetera, et cetera. When we rerun this, we can segment specifically for uh, what I think roads look like. And I did that earlier, so we don't have to wait. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at this colorful output. So now we're seeing all the unique segments, um, specifically what we care about is all the different ones that make up road features. Uh, for example, let me just select a couple here. So here's a, a road surface. 
Um, maybe we'll move in right here a little bit, another, you know, road surface segment selected, et cetera. And all these segments have, uh, you know, their own statistic structure to them. What we can do is we're going to go ahead and look at classification. Not only are we going to enable a custom classification, but we're also um, going to make a, a subclass as well. And I would make that a subclass of ground. And I already did this, so we're not going to walk through the selection. But what I would do um, is train a uh, some new samples. So I might select a segment and collect the sample and maybe do that a few times to get a representative sample of my rows and train based on that and then run that custom classifier. So let's take a look at my output. So I did this earlier, I'm gonna clear my selection and now we'll take a look based on classification. So now we'll see originally, right, all those roads, the pinkish purplish color, um, were initially part of ground, but we're able to pull them out um, and identify them now as their own custom classification. Uh, somebody asked if this would pick up parking lots too. So in this scenario, right, yes, it did. You can see all our parking lot services here. Um, that's not a, a broad answer. That's always going to be yes, right? It kind of depends um, how you train your classifier, what samples you use, right? So if I didn't include any um, representative samples of the parking lot service, I probably wouldn't have seen these get classified. Uh, so it kind of kind of depends on, on how you end up training that. What great question. Some other use cases, you know, you might see this applied. I've, I've been looking at this in regards to um, larger building structures, but very often, you know, large, think, you know, box store, big buildings with uh, lots of HVAC type units on the roof and those HVAC units get, um, considered part of the building roof, you know, looking at subclassifying those and pulling those out. Uh, we've had customers ask about, um, you know, doing this again from ground, but instead picking up, um, you know, paint on a road surface or, or really more specifically, uh, this is at an airport, right? Where the paint's much larger than a single stripe on the road. Um, so a, a variety of, um, different applications of this this type of process, but uh, a really handy way to further refine some of that custom classification. Um, definitely encourage everybody to check it out. This is a still a very new new tool, new functionality for us. Um, so having that feedback from from all of our users as we continue to work and refine on that tool is something um, that we always look forward to as as we're you know further improving these products. <clears throat> and, and just to note, uh, you know, coming back to the question about parking lots, someone noted that uh, in this data set, Jeff, the, some of the smaller paved pathways in a park have even been picked up um, by that custom classification. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great point. Um, right in, in this case, those features have statistics that are very similar to the road surface. And so, uh, you know, that's why they're getting grabbed because um, it's going to look for things that fit, you know, that kind of statistical parameter set that you build when you um, select your training samples. Um, again, not always going to be the case depending on how you set up your data, but in, in this workflow, yeah, that it, it did a really good job at that. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, I think we're more or less done taking a look at um, some of the newer features in Pro. Uh, I did see we just had somebody uh, ask if this is covered more in depth in our LiDAR training. Um, Mackenzie, do you know off the top of your head, I don't know that the training itself has been updated since release last week, um, but it's certainly something that will be coming, I assume. Mackenzie, do you know more than I do there? Um, no, unfortunately, I don't. I don't think that our training has been updated um, for this new 25.1 version of Global Mapper Pro. Um, but again, as Jeff said, that is something that is coming. And um, there'll be some more details on some of these tools um, in an online course on the, you know, what's new um, features with the data that we've we've worked with in this webinar, and that'll be freely available. Um, Jeff mentioned that at the beginning of the webinar, and that should be coming out within the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that if you want to explore some of these tools more. 
Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And and again, if you all start looking at this and um, you know have feedback, I genuinely we would love to hear it. Um, you know, we say this all the time: how much our users drive our products, but it's true. And, and getting that feedback and knowing what you want to do or what you are doing uh, is is really a great thing for us. Um, so keep an eye out for for new features there. Um, let's see what else do we have going on here. Mackenzie, do you want to talk a little bit about how you know upgrading works with the version 25.1 being released now and how users can get their hands on it if they haven't yet? Yeah, absolutely. So the easiest way to get Global Mapper 25.1 is, I mean, obviously you've got to download the program uh, and install this new version. Um, that download is available on our website. I've got the URL on screen here. Um, so you can go ahead and download the new version of Global Mapper. Now, in order to license the program, um, it depends a little bit on your license type and the status of your license. Um, if you have purchased your Global Mapper license within the past year, then you are in maintenance and support currently, and you should be able to license Global Mapper um, with an order number if you're working with a single user or a single floating license. Um, similarly, if you have paid up that annual maintenance and support fee um, and you are in current maintenance and support, then you should be able to do the same and license a floating or a, a floating single or a um, single node locked license with your order number um, through the license manager and Global Mapper will prompt you for that information when you go to boot up this, this new version of the program. Um, if you have a dongle license, so a USB key that controls your license for Global Mapper, making it easy to move the license from one machine to another, again, download Global Mapper 25.1, um, but you will need to contact our technical support or licensing teams um, to get an upgrade, uh, upgraded license for that USB key. Um, for that offline license type. So you know, we've got an email down at the bottom, orders at bluemarblegeo.com or authorize at bluemarblegeo.com to talk with our licensing team and make sure that USB key can be updated uh, with the new license for version 25.1. Our other license type is a network license. Um, those would need to be updated. You'd need a new license file for your network license server. If you're working within a bigger organization um, that has a, has a network license server maintained by someone else, you may need to just reach out and see if you can get that network license upgraded. Again, we would send you a new license file if you're in current maintenance and support, um, and you can get that upgraded and should be able to license Global Mapper 25.1 with that way. So, you know, a few different ways for different license types on how to upgrade um, and make sure that you're working with the most recent version of Global Mapper so that you get all the new tools that we've just gone over in this webinar. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, reach out to us, contact our licensing team, and we can help you check the status of your license, You know, renew your maintenance and support if needed, or expand the number of licenses you need of Global Mapper um, if you have more people looking to use the program. Awesome. Thanks for walking us through all that, Mackenzie. Um, I think that wraps us up for today. Uh, so I hope you got a, a nice peek into some of the, the new pro features in Global Mapper version 25.1. Uh, again, keep an eye out for the recording of this webinar um, and the posting of these workflows for both this week and last week's webinars to our new uh, online training website. Uh, so that you can work through things on your own as well. And as always, um, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions or comments. Mackenzie, thanks again for your help. It's always a pleasure. And with that, I hope everybody has a, a good rest of their day. Thank you.